So this is Canto 10, Chapter 4, verse, actually the atrocities of King Kamsa, verse number 
thirty. So, Akarnya Bartu Gaditam Akarnya Bar no Akarnya Bartu Ga Akarnya Bartu Gaditam Tamucho Deva Shastra Baha Devam Prati Krita Marsa Daita Ye Nati Kovidaha Akarnyam Bartu Gaditam Tamucho Deva Sastra Baha Devam Prati Krita Marsa Daitaya 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 Nata Kovitaha Akarnya Bartu Kaditam Tamuchur Deva Sastravaha Devam Prati Krita Marsa Daitaya Nati Kovitaha Akarnya, after hearing Bar 2 of their master, Gaditam, the words or statement, Tam Uchu, replied to him, Deva Satravaha, all the Asuras, who were the enemies of the demigods, Devan, the demigods, Prati, towards Rikrita Amarsaha, <coughs> who were envious, Daiteya, the Asuras, Na, not, 
Atiko Vitaha, who were very expert at executing transactions. <coughs> Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. <coughs> So Kamsa has just been thwarted by his, uh, by Durga Devi herself, and now he's become a little sober. But then he's back to his demoniac plans again. So now he's approaching his ministers, and he's telling them what needs to be done. So he just told them. And what the situation is that Krishna is born and we have to destroy him somehow. <clears throat> so now his ministers are listening and this is a narration of what happens. After hearing their master's statements, Kamsa, the envious Asuras who were enemies of the demigods and who were not very expert in dealings advise Kamsa as follows. Now they're going to speak to Kamsa what they feel is should be done. <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada's purport. There are two type, two different types of men, the Asuras and the Suras. Deva Bhuta Sago Loka Smin Daiva Sura Eva Cha Vishnu Bhakti Smito Daiva Asurya Tavi Parayaya. It's from the Padma Purana. <clears throat> Those who are devotees of Lord Vishnu Krishna are suras or devas, and, though, and whereas those who are opposed to the devotees are called asuras. Devotees are expert in all transactions. Yasyasti, bhakti, bhaktir, akinchana, suvai gunas tatra samastate sura. Therefore, they are called kovita, which means expert. Asuras, however, although superficially showing expertise in passionate activities, are actually all fools. They are neither sober nor expert. Whatever they do is imperfect. Mogaisya moga karmana. According to this description of the Asuras given in Bhagavad Gita 9.12, whatever they do will ultimately be baffled. It was such persons who advised Kamsa because they were his chief friends and ministers. Mm. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pasyatyade Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. And so, in the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna personally explains the two types of men and what are their qualities, characteristics, and activities. In the first three verses, he talks about saintly men and lists their characteristics and qualities, which are quite numerous. But he doesn't go beyond that. From verse 4, he introduces his next topic, and from onward, the whole chapter is about the demons. <laughs> Who they are, what they think, what are their activities, and what are their so-called qualities and characteristics. So in that description, we find, you know, they're unclean. They're always, uh, uh, they don't know what to do or what not to do. That's one of the verses. They always act based on their own selfish desires. And therefore, as Prabhupada says in this, they think they're expert, but they're quite foolish. And everything they do in due course of time is undone because they are acting against the will of the Lord and they usually cause 
not usually, always, cause harm to other living entities. So this feature of two types of personalities is an eternal feature. There will always be demons. <laughs> and there will always be godly. It's a question of how many. <laughs> it's a question of how many. In this age of Kali, the proportion is greater on the demonic side. Or people who are influenced by demonic characteristics and qualities, or lifestyles. The demons are very expert in putting out propaganda about how you should live life. And how you should live life is eat, sleep, no, eat, drink, be merry, and enjoy your senses to the utmost. And give us as much money as you can. <laughs> because that's what you're for, to support our desires. So the demon, demons are like that. <clears throat> they have no good habits. They're always unclean. They're always prone to cause destruction and harm to themselves and others. And they make big plans in order to stockpile weapons and also to use those weapons. As Prabhupada said when he was in one discussion talking about uh, demons and devotees, and the devotees were explaining how the different countries are now getting the nuclear bombs. And so one country after another, first was America, then it was Russia, and then it was Pakistan, no, Pakistan came later, China. And gradually now, mostly every country, it's most, not mostly, but many countries have nuclear weapons. So the devotees said, you know, but because they know how destructive it is, and because they know their enemies have them, they will not use it. It's like a standoff. Because you have it, and I have it, therefore we won't use it because we know we'll both suffer. Prabhupada completely uh, destroyed that argument. He said, if they create it, they'll use it. <laughs> he said, this is the history. So they have been stockpiling weapons for a long time and more and more now arsenals all around the world. Someday they'll use it and they're ready to use it any time. And that's just the way they think. They don't care. And the demons don't care. And they have their plans to survive amongst all this holocaust that they create. In fact, they look forward to that. They're waiting for the right time. <clears throat> and this is their plans. And innocent people are exploited and innocent people have to suffer because of that. So Prabhupada, this is, this is a constant or eternal battle between Asura and Asura, De, as Devasura, Devs and Asura. It goes on in the heavenly planets. Sometimes people aspire for a better material situation up beyond this world. This is Swargaloka, the place of Indra, where the heaven planets. People have a chance to live very long lives, and their bodily features are very strong and they have very great quality, abilities to enjoy sense gratification way beyond we, what we do. And the quality of their sense gratification will look, our, look like our sense gratification is just another form of suffering. They have the ability to enjoy much greater than we do. But Prabhupada said, although in the heavenly planets, everything is materially nice. There's always fights between the demons and the demigods. That goes on. Just like we hear, um, Krishna appeared on this planet at the time when the world was overburdened with demoniac forces. So at that time, Krishna advented. So what was the history that brought all these demonic, demoniac forces all over the world? It's interesting, it goes back thousands of years before that, when Parasaram, who was an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was on earth, and he came to destroy the evil kings who were ruling the world. So with his acts, he destroyed 21 generations of Kshatriyas, who were all envious and proud and exploiting the people. So after that, the whole world was practically rid of Kshatriyas. There wasn't any real rulers. So it became a problem after uh, Parasaram did his service. So now what to do? 
So saintly persons who were there got together and decided, along with the royal class that were still on the earth, what should we do to bring about saintly rule? All the Kshatriyas have been destroyed. So they made an interesting plan. The sages are in the mode of goodness, and the Kshatriyas, or those who are born in that, are somewhat affected by the mode of passion. So they decided to unite the women of the Kshatriya clan with the sages and produce Rajarsis, or great saintly kings. And so that was done. The sages made this great sacrifice so they could bring about a population of saintly kings. And then again, the world was, it took many hundreds and hundreds of years, but again, the world again was ruled by saintly kings. This is in the Mahabharata. But then a big fight broke out in the heavenly planets between the Asuras and the Asuras. And the Asuras were looking for some place that they could use as a base to fight the demigods. So they chose Earth. And what they did, they took birth in all species of life, and even lower species of life, and in human life. And again, they overcome the earth. And that is where you see when Kamsa was there and he was sending so many of these demons, Agasura and Bakasura and Palambasura. These were all these demons that were on earth during the time of Kamsa. And they were powerful. They were not friends of Kamsa. They were actually just demons. Kamsa, he actually destroyed or not destroyed, but defeated each one of them and made those demons his servants. That's why he was able to send all these demons to Vrindavan to try to kill Krishna. But of course, no one can kill Krishna. Krishna is God. <laughs> and so now you had this situation on earth where all the demons had again taken over the earth after hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years actually. And then it says that the demigods were disturbed and therefore they went to the milk ocean and prayed. We hear in the Srimad Bhagavatam they offered beautiful prayers, Purusha Shukta prayers to Shirodakshai Vishnu along with Brahma, Indra and all the demigods. And at that time Krishna agreed to advent and he came. So then you see here we are, this is where we are in this part, and all the demons are here. And now Krishna is on earth and he's about to unfold his mission. And they're worried. Uh, Kamsa has been, was killed in his previous life by an incarnation of the Lord, uh, Harani, not Haranika, but Nishringadev. And so now he's, he's worried that he's going to be killed again. And that was the prophecy, because he heard when he was, his. His sister, Devaki, was going to be married, or was married to actually Vasudev, was on the wedding day. And Kamsa, being the brother, was thinking, oh, I should do some service for my sister, it's her wedding day. So he decided to drive the chariot to their place of, of residence. But what happened? He hears a voice, you fool, Kamsa, you don't know but the eighth child of your sister will be the cause of your death. So then, being a demon and not considering anything but his own interest, he was about to kill his own sister. It says Prabhupada makes this point. In many lectures, he says, the demons will do anything. And after he says that, he says, anything. <laughs> to make the point, they'll kill Every, even their family members, friends, anyone for their own selfish interests. That's, that's demons. So you might say, well, how do we know who's a demon, who's not a demon? You don't see the big demons anymore around. We have a little, lot of little demons that are running around here making policies, but they're not really much of a threat. There are big demons who are working from other planets to try to destroy this planet right today. And they're using their agents on this earth to try to capture more and more of the resources. That's the whole demonic plan. They have so much money. They don't need money. 
What is a demonic malatality? Control. They want to control everything. Just like now, they know everything about you. The government knows everything about you. <laughs> That's fine. They know all, they have all these records and they have all these systems and they're always asking for more information so they can get more and more. And so their idea is to control and then there's trying to, now they're trying to do this political thing of bringing the countries into a larger block. You know, you have, you have the North American block, you have the Asian block, you have the, they did it in Europe, they call it, they made it one currency, Euros. So they're going to have five blocks, and then after they get five blocks of different lands, then they're going to merge them gradually into one. This is their overall plan, and then they want to rule the whole world. That's, that's their whole process. So it's going on today. Yeah, but you don't even know who they are. They're, they're powerful persons who have great, great influence in politics and government and in any, every area of society, and they influence policies through that. Just like you watch the news. The news is simply propaganda. What goes on in the news is not really what's happening. They put out what, they want, what you want to see. That's all. It's not real stuff. The real stuff goes on behind the scenes. And then, you know, they give you a little bit of the truth, but it's just a little token of what's actually happening. So this is, this is the demon. So, and so Krishna has invented as Chita Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So as Krishna came 5,000 years ago to destroy this, you know, demoniac influence that was on the earth, 5,000, Krishna's come again 432 years ago? Yeah to again destroy the demons. And this is the Sankirtan movement. So Lord Chaitanya has come with the weapons. Krishna Varnam Tusa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshatam Yagnai Sankirtana Praya Yajantihi Sumeda Saha. So in that verse it mentions that Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself, but he's Tusa Krishna. He's not black. He is, has a different form. His form is golden. He's called Garanga. And he's come with his weapons, his associates, and to bring about a revolution of God consciousness all over the earth. So that is this Krishna consciousness movement. We have been chosen by Lord Chaitanya, or anyone who comes into this movement, to be his assistant to spread Krishna consciousness around the world, to pick, push back this demoniac influence. And you see, today, the devotees are in a small number and the demons are in a small number. The majority of the people are in between. They're innocent, but they're influenced in the wrong way. So, but what is happening in Kali Yuga, because of the influence of the demons, people are going from one side to the other. So these two end result, two end groups, us and the demons, are becoming bigger. People are either going more degraded or people are running to the saintly side and becoming more interested in spiritual life. It's happening on both sides. So the margin or the majority is starting to move one side or the other. So this will continue and then what will happen, <clears throat> I sound like a, you know, like I know everything, but I know a few things. What will happen is that the demons will get so powerful and they'll start to fight against each other. And they'll use their bombs and destroy each other. And the planet will go through hell for a while. And then the devotees will be there. Devotees won't be doing anything but helping people out during the war. And after that, what will happen is that preaching will be really good. And then Lord Chaitanya's movement will really take off after the next war. So Prabhupada said the next war is between demons and demons. <laughs> because they're envious of each other. They can't get along. They may make an agreement with each other for a little while and then it breaks after some time and then they always fight against each other for whatever policy they make. So therefore the devotees, what, what is our job? We're trying to save as many souls as possible trying to bring as many people to Krishna consciousness so that they, they don't have to be affected by this, this influence of the demonic. And everyone's influenced by them. 
just like advertising. Advertisement is demoniac. It's a, it's a demoniac principle. They create the idea that you need this, even though you don't need it. And they have to come up with some ideas, slogans, and arrangements to make it sound like you have to buy this product. And if you don't, you're not up, you're not with it. You're, you really can't really make it in this world. So this idea of advertising, and how do they do it? It's usually some nice girl there to make sure you read the, the billboard or whatever ad. They actually study how you spend your money. And they have people studying your, your, your spending mood and then they bombard you with the same idea so you buy more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And more. So this is, this is going on in the name of civilization, progress, like that. It's all about them becoming more powerful and them controlling the world more and more. That's all it is about. Communism failed. Why did communism fail? They tried it with communism. It failed. Why? Because when you suppress people, people revolt. You can't force people by, by suppressing them. So what they have, they realize that's come. That's why they, they destroyed this idea of communism. It's still there and here and there. But now their program is get people so hooked on sense gratification that they become stupid and they can't organize and they can't get together and just sell them a bunch of stuff. Give, just keep them pacified through various types of entertainment and forms of different types of sense enjoyment and that way we can control them easily. We got them. Smart was one Italian communist during World War II, he wrote about that. He said, communism will never work if you suppress them. Give them everything in the form of sense gratification and you got them, no problem. So that's what's happening today. More and more junk on the market, more and more things to do, more and more things to buy, more and more things to get involved in. It's, in 19, and I'm sorry, 1850, and we're going back about 170 years ago, in 1850, the amount of products that were available to people on the market, this is 1850 now, this is way back, this is just about the time of the Industrial Revolution, 95% was necessities. So what was available was not it was necessities. Five percent was extra. It's reversed now. <laughs> Every day, so much junk. <laughs> and they just keep selling, exploiting the earth, and trying to get as much money as they can. And the money's useless anyway. It's all paper. They give you some paper. You got some paper. You got nothing. If you don't have gold or precious metal, your paper is worth nothing. At one time, the government will say, hmm, Okay, that's it. Paper's no good. <laughs> Prabhupada gives a whole hour lecture about the uselessness of, of the money today. And he talks about the history of how money has evolved from precious metals now to this paper currency. They used to put, you know, you could change this into gold, but you can't do that anymore. It's just a piece of paper, that's all. I got more paper than you, I'm richer than you. I mean, for now, it has some spending power, so. But in itself, it's worthless. It's, worth, it's backed by zero. They say backed by gold, try cashing it in for gold. You won't get anything. Now you have all these shops all over the country. We will buy your gold. Bring gold, because they want gold. They know gold is valuable. Precious metals is, what is wealth? Precious metals, land. If you have property, you have wealth. If you're renting, you got nothing. Buy your house, and then you have some equity. And if you can, live simply and have some cows, grow your own food, then you have something. Otherwise, you have nothing, really. You're just living by whatever the government throws at you. And then basically you have pretty much, you're simply a puppet in whatever policies they make, like that. But if you have land, 
And if you have livestock, cows, you have something, you have some value there. That's equity and, it, and it's, it's sustainable too. It's sustainable. So the demons are trying whatever they can to somehow or other control the whole world like that. And the devotees know that if we simply propagate the chanting of the holy names in every town and village, we can push back the influence of demonic. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission is empowered by God itself. He's come to bring a whole revolution in God consciousness all over the world. And he's asking us to help him. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, in, the, in chapter 9 of Adi Leela, Lord Chaitanya is begging us. He says, I am a gardener and I have stockpiled a whole warehouse full of wonderful fruits. And these are fruits of love of God. And I am tasting these fruits and these fruits are very sweet. And I want to distribute these fruits to everyone so they can also taste the sweetness of these fruits. But I'm only one person. So please help me. <laughs> Take the fruits, enjoy it yourself, give it to others. So he's asking us to be an instrument for his mercy to spread Krishna conscious everywhere. Like that. And when we do that, we actually get special mercy. Prabhupada says, when you preach, even if you don't have much success, simply by your efforts, Krishna will recognize you. He says, if you want to be recognized by Krishna, preach Krishna consciousness. Or do something that will be an effort to bring others closer. Sometimes we call it preaching, sometimes we call it outreach, but it's really a mood of wanting to help others. It may take different forms like that. And even distributing prasadam or educating people in, in a very, and just, just be an instrument for his mercy for others. And then Krishna recognize, when you get recognized by Krishna, your whole life is successful. He's recognizing your devotion, but he he's more, really wants to see, all right, I'm giving you something. Now you, 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 you give that to others. And when you do that, you'll be happy and you'll make others happy. And I will be very pleased with you. This is Lord Chaitanya's movement. So he's encouraging us, spread the Sankirtan movement everywhere. Do it individually, do it collectively, but do it somehow. Otherwise, we will see that if the devotees don't come up to the standards, we will also be more and more affected by the influence of this demoniac wave that is moving throughout the world. And it's moving. It's moving quite strongly. But when we take shelter of Krishna through the holy name and preach, we are protected by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu directly like that. He protects his devotees 100%. There was two devotees. This was in 1973. Maybe you heard this story before. The devotees were asked by Srila Prabhupada to go what was then called East Bengal. And there was a war during that time. And there was a war between, I think it was Pakistan and India. So maybe you heard of that war, 1973, 72. Maybe it was even earlier. So two, two sannyasis, Brahmananda and Pushta Krishna, were asked by Prabhupada to go, and so they did. Now they're in the midst of this area where there's a lot of fighting going on. And they're doing some preaching and they're having some success. And then Prabhupada is hearing that the war is actually getting worse and it's very dangerous for foreigners to be there. So he starts sending out messages to come back, but he's not getting any response. So he's worried. So he starts praying for the devotees. Now, finally, the messages come by way of others that you guys should leave here. It's dangerous. So they decide to go. And the transportation out of the country wasn't so easy. 
And so they, uh, they got on a bus. But the borders were being guarded by the Islamic army. And they were stopping any kind of transport coming out. And if they see a person who was not of the Islamic faith, possible enemy, traitor, or somebody, uh, they, were going to, they were killing them. So the bus gets to the border, it stops. The soldiers go on the bus, they see two Hindus dressed in the Hindu garments, and they were dressed like that. They pull them off the bus, and they put them in front of a firing squad. <laughs> now they're about to you know, execute them. And Brahmananda, he gets an inspiration, and he picks his beads, he's got his beads in his hand, and he just puts his beads up in the air, and he says to push the Krishna, we're going back to Godhead. Let's just chant. We're going back to Godhead. And he becomes very animated and he starts chanting loudly. Push the Krishna picks up on it and does the same. And they're both chanting loudly. The soldiers got bewildered. I don't know what they were thinking. But anyway, they decided. Then the, the main man came over and said, all right, get out of here. Go. Leave, leave the country. And this. So when they took shelter of the holy name, there was nothing that could happen to them. <laughs> now you might think, will that work for me? Yes. <laughs> it works for everybody. If you sincerely take shelter of Krishna's holy name, you are free from the influence of the material energy. So that's the understanding. So whatever is out there in the terms of materialism, cannot affect the devotee who is under the shelter of, you know, Krishna's only, because Krishna's name is prophylactic and antiseptic. Prophylactic means protective, and antiseptic means purifying. So this movement will be spread as much as we can spread the holy name to every town and village. And it's happening, it's slowly, but it's not happening fast enough. It's not happening fast. So it's a race between the demons and the devotees to try to capture as many souls as possible. So you see, this, this, this feature of demons and devotees at each other's throat goes back. It's, it's a historical phenomenon. It'll continue to go on. Prabhupada said there will always be demons who will oppose the authority of the Supreme Lord and try to usurp as much of the Lord's property as they can for their own selfish, evil interests like that. So we have a great mission. And if we preach Krishna consciousness and just chant the holy names of the Lord, then honest people will come. People are now looking. I did a class here the other day on Wednesday. Uh, about 70, maybe 70 or more students came. They were all from the Christian background. They came to learn a little bit about Krishna consciousness. Amazing questions. Went on, the questions went on for an hour and a half, just the questions. I spoke for about 10 minutes. People are interested. We have something. We got substance. We got, this philosophy cannot be counteracted. It's solid. It's coming from the spiritual world. We also have the holy name and that is the astra or the weapon in this age to push back the demoniac influence and to inspire people to come to krishna consciousness Prabhupada said it is chanting the holy names and prashadam we should flood the world with these two things if you have money if you have resources if you have influence whatever you do use those things to bring about people get more opportunities to chant, to get prashadam, to come to programs like that. Then we're doing a great service for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And these two things, prashadam and the holy name, of course, there's the philosophy. But how many people can understand this philosophy? Very few. I mean, few people do. And some people take it up, but generally, that's not what sustains them. People are sustained by the happiness they get from chanting Hare Krishna and by the kindness of the devotees. When the devotees go out of their way to show kindness to the conditioned souls, people recognize that, that these people actually have something and they actually care about us. 
So the more we get out there, these temples are for, simply for a place for people to come. But our business is out there, out there with all the conditioned souls to give them Krishna consciousness as much as we can. And then, and then the more we do that, the more Krishna will, will empower his devotees to become his instruments to spread Krishna consciousness. Everyone can be empowered. It's not like you have to have a position or you have to have a particular, you know, philosophical ability to speak. None of these things are the qualifications. It's simply your desire. If you have that desire to spread Krishna consciousness, Krishna will show you how to do that in one way or the other like that. So the more we can do that, the more we will also feel satisfied in our practice. And so, and Prabhupada, you know, he said, it's a fight. We have to, he said, Maya, she's not our enemy. Maya's our friend. But because there are demons, Maya must do her service. He makes that statement. Because there's demons, therefore she does her service. Like that. So anyway, um, this is, so we're hearing more about that here. And Krishna's just a little baby, you know. Apparently he's, well, we say he's vulnerable to what is happening around him. But and everyone's trying to protect Krishna, hide him from Kamsa, like that. But I think, was it, um, yeah, last night in the presentation by Sureshwar, he was saying that when you... Vasudev was, he from the mind of Vasudev, his Krishna consciousness went into the mind of Devaki, and from the, the mind of Devaki came into the heart of Devaki, and from that, Krishna was born. So Krishna is born in each of our existence in our lives when we bring in transcendental knowledge and transcendental activities. And then a person becomes pregnant. <laughs> it's like almost like conception. What is that conception? Krishna is born in our life. In other words, we actually can experience the presence of Krishna 24 hours a day. He's always with his devotee. We have to bring that knowledge, bring that, that enthusiasm for chanting more and more and more and more and more. We don't want to be forced to do it. Right now we can say, oh, it's, it's not so bad, things are going on. But as time goes on, you're going to see things are going to crumble. And Prabhupada said, he said that one day people will be dying in the streets by the thousands. And you can you can look it up on the beta days. And then he also said, this Krishna consciousness movement will save the world from its darkest hour. Like that. So the plan makers, the demons, the politicians, and people who are controlling all these politicians behind the scenes, they're making their plans to somehow or other destroy each other. <laughs> like that. Right now there's little wars going on. There's always wars going on. And it's more and more like that. More and more diseases are coming by way of sinful activities. They try to stop disease, stop sinful activities, you stop disease. It's simply diseases, all these epidemic diseases are, are simply reactions for sinful activities, that's all. The hospitals are full, people are getting more and more sick. Why? Because they don't know how to live properly. It's just this age is so contaminated with sinful activities that if you're a righteous person, you're actually unusual. <laughs> yeah, right? You have to be somewhat cunning and somewhat, uh, you know, like a little bit, well, I don't know what the word is, but you know, you, you have to have, you have to be your own man <laughs> in order to make it. If you're humble and you're out there in the world, people don't really appreciate that so much because you can't get ahead if you're humble. <laughs> you have to, you know, you have to be like, like I was giving a lecture to a group of Indian businessmen and 
This was in Chicago, I think it was about 15 years ago, and one of them said, you know, Maharaj, we're in the workplace, you know, we try to become humble, and they look at us like, you know, this is not going to work here. <laughs> it's not going to work here. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you're, this is the environment. <laughs> so you have to be kind of like, figure out ways to take people's money, and, and have them like you at the same time. <laughs> so that's the whole program. So we have something wonderful. We have Lord Chaitanya's mercy in the form this, of this Harinam Sankirtan. It's powerful. It can't be stopped. Prabhupada said this movement cannot be stopped externally. It can only be stopped internally. And that is if we become insincere and we become somewhat lazy in our practice of Krishna consciousness we need to have we need to be understand that we have something very valuable this mercy is very rare and because we have the mercy we have a chance to purify our life and go back to the spiritual world but that's not Lord Chaitanya's movement Lord Chaitanya movement says as Sureshwar was saying last night by my command be guru save the land. Lord Chaitanya made that statement to the Korma Brahma when he was traveling in, in South India. But that statement was for everyone. That was for everyone. Everyone. He said, everyone, you, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. Whoever you meet, help them understand that their relationship or their happiness is based on their practice of spiritual life. In other words, be an instrument for Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And everybody can do it. All you have to have is one thing, desire. And when you have that desire, Krishna will show you through various ways how to fulfill that desire. It's all based on desire. Okay, any questions? Comments? Yes. Um, I don't get these classes so often, but... Yeah, it's wonderful class, Maharaj, actually. Um, pretty much uh, touching on this social, economic, you know, realities of the world. And there was one thing that you mentioned that uh, there is going to be a confrontation. There's going to be a conflict, demons against demons. They're going to destroy themselves. Yeah, you can see they're stockpiling more and more weapons. Pakistan yeah. is crazy, you know. <laughs> it's a mm. crazy country. <laughs> They have nuclear bombs now. Even the smaller countries are getting weapons like that. Pakistan, Prabhupada said the war will start between Pakistan and India. They're still fighting on the Kashmir border. It's still going on today. Mm -hmm. Small skirmishes. You don't hear it in the news because that, that part of the news is blocked out. They don't want you to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, so I wanted to ask you... Um, as the as the devotees go through all these, you know, things that are going to happen, in one sense, what's the best approach? Should be sort of not making too much. Do your thing. Do our sankirtan business without um, disturbing or having the demons you know being too we don't confront them we yeah, just we do, our, our job is simply to try to get as many conditioned souls to become krishna conscious as possible so we do that through preaching the philosophy we do that through prashadam distribution we do that through various outreach programs inviting people for festivals but once we get people to come, we need to develop them and help them become fixed in their practice of Krishna consciousness. Our problem is we're doing a lot of preaching and people are coming, but we don't have a, a way to really keep them in. We need to have a process to move persons from point A all the way up to point Z. In other words, more and more organized programs of development. So as people progress, they can go from the next stage like that. So bringing people in, educating them, training them, engaging them like that. 
It's all part of the process. Bring them in. We used to bring people in and then we engaged them. But education and training has to be there. Training in the philosophy, uh, education in the philosophy, training in the, in the behavior. What is the etiquette of a Vaishnava? How a Vaishnava acts, thinks, and you know interacts. Vaishnava etiquette, Prabhupada said, behavior is more important than philosophy. <laughs> he made that point. Behavior is more important than the philosophy. Because even if your behavior is not good and you know the philosophy, then it's something else. It's more based on your own interest. So the proper etiquette. We need to teach etiquette. We need to teach philosophy base. Vaishnav culture. The culture of spirituality, which is different than the culture of material life. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole another discussion. Sureshwar, any comment on that? Yeah, that's part of his. Please come to Sureshwar's presentation. This is a landmark presentation. You will not find anything so, what we say, relevant to your spiritual life than what he's presented. It's the most relevant thing. Go ahead. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something. Um, just, this is just one of your examples. You were saying how you can't be humble and make it in the corporate world, for example. Satyanandan Swami tells a story. Before he was a devotee, he tried to get a job in Germany. And the guy said, I'm sorry, I can't hire you. You're too honest. Because <laughs> Sachi Nandan Swami, he's like an open book, you know, he's such an open heart. Yeah. And then that's what they said. You're very bright, you're very nice, but you're too honest. You're not going to yeah. make it in the world of cheaters and cheaters. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, that's somewhat, what's the word, indicative of, of what goes on here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for your class. You made a lot of good points. Uh, you were mentioning um, that everything that demons do in due course of time is destroyed. And you also mentioned Lord Chaitanya's chapter, Adilila chapter 9, where he distributes the fruit. One thing I, I remember in that chapter, I can't remember the specific verse, but interesting thing that Lord Chaitanya says in that chapter, he says, uh, more fruit of devotional service is worth more than all the wealth in the three worlds. Um, that reminds me of a quote that says, uh, you would never invite a thief into your house. So why would you allow thoughts that steal your joy to make themselves at home in your mind? And there are many thoughts that steal our joy, like envy, greed, uh, vengeance. So my question is, is actually uh, related to uh, the point you were making about when the Christian group came here. Uh, my brother had a similar experience or slightly different. When the Christian group came here and he was the speaker, they actually asked him, what do you do for fun? Now, my brother reads the Bhagavatam for five hours for fun because <laughs> he used to read chess books all the time. So it was kind of natural for him. Now, if we told people we're here to make money, you know, not material money, but spiritual money, and that's come through, you know, studying, like you said, education, that's not very appealing because it's not arousing to our senses. So how to, how to develop faith in things that are not arousing yeah. to our senses? Well, honest people, when we say there are a lot of honest people in the world today, they're getting burnt out. They don't have many recourses anymore. They're trying different things. People are looking for spirituality, but they're rejecting religion. Shiva Ram Maharaj gives a nice explanation of the difference between organized religion and spirituality. It's quite different when you actually analyze what are the components that make up each. And people are looking for spirituality. So we got that because we're not a religion. We're a spiritual culture that is teaching people what is their real identity. We're not talking about Hinduism or this ism or that ism, that is not our program. It's about understanding yourself as a spiritual being and then bringing that awareness to your in your life. That's all. This is, and what does it center around? Glorifying the Lord by chanting His holy name. 
and that holy name can be in any of the religious traditions like that. You know, we're not about just jamming rules and regulations on people. Just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> take some prasadam, read some books. You know, take, you know, this is, a, this is our process like that. And you'll start to experience a difference in your life. There's two questions back there behind you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm to push it a little. Okay. I really appreciated what you said about communism, the hypocrisy, because one of their tenements or statements is repression breeds resistance yeah and look what they're doing you know i just and i want to also say i enjoyed what you said about uh some of the other things you were talking about about uh, worldliness and money and all of, all your points were right on when you do a little investigation you'll find more <laughs> yes Maharaj, thank you for this thought-provoking and practical class. I always enjoy it when you can apply some of the philosophy um, to our everyday lives, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to be, uh, you know, we are all in, most of us are grihastas uh, in this congregation. And, uh, IT? No, mm -hmm. sales of vitamins, actually. Um, and Salesman, huh? Yeah. yeah, so I'm a sales leader. I'm a vice president of sales, and it's quite interesting because um, I get to, to influence um, culture and the way we could do business and um, and you're absolutely right there is um, greed um, plays a huge role um, but what my experience has been um, that humbleness truthfulness trust are the hallmarks of success and even in the material world and when you can create a team that in a company that um, embodies those characteristics, material success, material what? Success? Material success yeah. is even easier. So, uh, although I agree with you that the material uh, that the world is full of uh, junk, 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 yeah, <laughs> and uh, just look at the highways. They have these big, big storehouses now. Right. You can uh, rent one for. So much more money after you spend our money collecting your junk, then you rent the place right. to store your junk. Yeah. Uh, and so I guess my point is um, we do have to live in this material world. And the hope is that if we, practice, if we take these concrete principles of what we're learning um, from Prabhupada's mission, um, they can be applied. Um, and yeah. you, can, you, can, you can be in the world um, and still hold on to your principles and be successful. So I would argue um, humbly that humbleness is a strength. And if you're, you may walk into a certain organization and that may be seen as a weakness, but if that humbleness grows and germinates within an organization, it's very powerful. And what, is, what is the nature of that humbleness? What, what is it directed towards? Well, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, if you, that humbleness, if your true intention, whenever you sell anything, if your true intention is to provide a service that is useful and beneficial, and you're not trying to just sell junk, as you had mentioned. Then, then you can take a... Uh, I, uh, salary cut and you'll still be happy, right? Because humility is your mo motivation, not the salary. Uh, maybe I'm not making my point very well. My point is this, you can point is nobody works without getting some... Sure, you have to have necessities, right? Uh, yeah, but up to even what point? spiritually we're, we're... Up to what point is it necessity and what, but what is it beyond that? I'm not sure where... <laughs> my, my point is this, uh, that Humbleness, truthfulness, even spirituality, if applied you can, properly. You, you can try to bring in some kind of piety within, within the business world. Right. But the whole business world is competitive and is based on cheating. That's all, the whole thing. Well, yeah, but uh, we have to look, you know, Prabhupada, I believe, mentioned that, you know, um, we, have, we live in a material world. 
So we have to have the skill set of a material. So I okay. believe. Okay, I'm not saying you should stop your work, but if you want to really purify your activities, whatever profits you make, take a portion of that and give that to support religious principles. Agreed. Then, then you can take that extra, and it's called karma yoga. It means you, you have a particular desire to act in a certain way, and then the results of that, and you offer part of that results to devotion to Krishna, and that relieves you from the reaction of what we say, accumulating or becoming greedy simply for you know material gain. That's a hundred percent agree. Yeah, that's part of bhakti yoga. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, and so my comment was to support the fact that there is all this greediness and and uh, and and that humbleness is you know comp com competition is viewed as how you succeed and things like that but in the inverse in a world full of that truthfulness steadfastness spirituality and humbleness also resonate because people are yearning yeah, for that so you can be it, successful with your principles yeah, that was my point okay. Thank you, very much. you can you can be a nice guy but it'll be challenged He'll be challenged, just like Sri Swar said. If you're too honest, you don't get the job. Uh, there's a there's a particular scripture. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called a Mano Samhita. You heard of Mano Samhita? It's called the Law Books of Mankind. It's from the Vedas. And Mano Samhita talks about all aspects of life, and it talks about business also. And Mano Samhita gives a formula for for acting within the business realm in terms of profit says Mano Samhita says you're not allowed to make more than 25 percent profit and you can live on that profit and whatever else you make you put back in for the services for others that's all if you make more now they're making what 100 percent 200 percent 500 percent profit and, then, and the more you can go up the more you're successful in the business world like that so it's it's really about bringing about a culture of buying. <laughs> it's about a culture of buying. And the Shastras say, Ishavasham idam sarvam, yat kinchat dam tigat. Live according to your needs. If you live beyond that, you'll have to suffer. Because this is from Sri Upanishads, which is one of the main which is the Vedas themselves. The Upanishads are not the corollaries. They're the, they're the, the actual Vedas. That we live according to our needs. If you live beyond that, then whatever else you make, give it to Krishna. Everyone wants to live, you know, more houses, more cars, more computers, more clothes, more places to go, more. The, process, the idea is more. I see it everywhere. Well, if you're devotees, you you have you have some spiritual qualities. Yeah, I agree. We are going to corporates. I, I've been to many corporations and given lectures. Radha Swami has gone to Google. He's gone to Apple. He's gone to so many major corporations and spoken about the principles that make up, what would he say, the mode of goodness that will lead people to spiritual principles. It's a stepping stone program. So you can do that. Yeah, and you should do that in your job. Like, I don't know, you've heard of Ernest Young? That, that corporation. I've been there at least two or three times in London. And we have some big persons who are of the Indian nationality, and so we arrange programs and we get some of the you know, workers to come and we talk about Krishna conscious principles. Hey, that's honesty, that's humility, and that's giving people a chance to see beyond the day to day life of simply trying to make money to maintain themselves like that. That's necessary. So I'm not uh, challenging what you do, but you're, you're going to have to interject something to make it 
you know, somewhat of the mode of goodness and somewhat spiritual. It has to come from the individuals who are there. It's not going to come from the corporate executives. They have their programs to make, they expand their, you know, their, their corporations more and more and more. It's about, because material life means expand, expand, expand. Keep going. If you don't expand, you go down. <laughs> Prabhupada was a businessman before he came to Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and he was a good businessman. <laughs> he actually had the chance to become as rich as Bila. <laughs> and he said he had that, he, that he was told by an astrologer, if he stayed in his, that, he would be one of the richest men in India. So he knew what business is like. <laughs> it's not like he was ignorant of that. But you have to understand there's a limit. On what, how much, on us, on what we do as an individual, we have to say, hey, that's it. I have to have time for Krishna consciousness. It's not about making money all the time. Give him the microphone. Yeah. I, I think my point is more. Uh, attuned to the fact that the qualities, the spiritual qualities that we gain through this movement are, can be transferred. Yeah. And more importantly, it's not about how much more money I can make with those qualities. It's the fact that people are yearning for that, those qualities in a person in corporations. Yeah. yeah. And so instead of shying away, you can actually... Um, preach in a different way as I think you mentioned yeah, there's we, different forms of preaching we do that and you can preach through your example and at the same time be successful in that material world because at the core fundamental level which you were saying a little or earlier people searching for that spirituality yeah they are and so when they see you perform through your actions um, in a business setting with core fundamentals of truthfulness and trust they're intrigued, and that actually um, is can my you, my experience. Can you do it? Absolutely, I can do it. You're not challenged. I do it every single day, and and Are I you do challenged? it. And I've created an organization that does it. Okay, there you okay? go. Okay, and so the point is, hire some devotees. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> no, no, my point is, this is very practical, and we, and instead of hopelessness, it actually is is the fact that it's practical. Oh, what you're saying is what we want. We want to spread spiritual life through various agencies of the material world. It's not all about living in temples and just chanting Hare Krishna. It's reaching all aspects of life. Yeah. Business is a big part of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But good luck. <laughs> If you can do it, you're, you know, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, bring more devotees in. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we, t oh, okay, Leela Manjari. Yeah. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. You were talking about the um, importance of nurturing devotees after they come. So I was thinking like, um, it feels as if it's one uh, segment of their journey until the point of initiation. Uh, but what after initiation? How, did, how do we nourish devotees after initiation? We so give them opportunities for nourishment by having programs. You know, once they're initiated, they understand the principles. They're working under the guidance of their spiritual master. Now we can give them more and more opportunities to strengthen their Krishna consciousness through various types of seminars, discussions. And we inspire them to be creative in their own Krishna consciousness where they can think of ways how to expand their service in different ways. Whatever service you've been doing, if you think, how can I do it better or how can I do it more? And then you start to activate some ideas. And there's so many ideas out there which you can also use to help them. So we want to engage people 
in a way that they can be creative in their own service. Even if you're a floor cleaner, you can always think how to do it better. Every service can be expanded more and more. If you have that mood, I want to do it better, like that. Whatever you're doing, whatever it is, do it better, or try to do it better, like that. If you're thinking, I just got to get it done, then that's what will happen. You'll get it done. But you won't stay inspired. Inspiration comes with the idea of creativity, trying to think how to expand whatever you're doing. Expansion comes in two forms. It comes, it comes in quantity or it comes in quality. Expansion comes in quantity by thinking how to do more and quality by thinking how to do better. What's more important? Both are important, but quality is really more about expansion. Try to do whatever you're doing better. Try to do it better, that's all. Okay, thank you very much. Sila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Gaur Premanande, Hari Hari Go, Hare Krishna. Come today at 11 o'clock, is it? 11 o'clock here for session number two of Founder Acharya by Suresh Prabhu.